Hello, how's everyone doing today? I'm here with uh, special guest Stephen Kinsella. Stephen Kinsella is an intellectual property lawyer. He's uh, also uh, a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute and the author of uh, the book Against Intellectual Property. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Um, uh, thanks for having me on. I, re I really appreciate this. No time. No thank you. No problem. Anytime. Um, my first question is, um, what brought you to uh, anarchy? I think, I mean, it's lost in the midst of time. Um, I was in law school. I was a Randian, minarchist type, um, hostile to uh, anarchy because of her you know, repeated attacks on it. But I think I eventually stumbled upon Rothbard, like For a New Liberty, and David Friedman's Machinery of, Machinery of Freedom. So I'd say around 88 or 89 when I was in law school, I finally uh, recognized that they were – uh, taking the libertarian ideas in the logical you know, direction that they need to go. So uh, anarchy started seeming obvious to me. So I would, I would say it was uh, David Friedman, Murray Rothbard, and uh, the Tannehills in, in their book, The Market for Liberty. Yeah. I, I've, I've, I've always been somewhat surprised that Ayn Rand would be so hostile. I mean considering her background, I mean she, her family was totally dis destroyed and ruined by their government. You would assume that… Probably she should be somewhat sympathetic, right? I agree. I've, I've been surprised too. Um, in fact, I think that um, – I mean you can understand why she came from a totalitarian regime, and from her point of view, the United States sort of minarchist, founding fathers, classical liberal approach seemed like a breath of fresh air, right? Like the Renaissance or like um, you know, the way it should be. So I think she 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 clung to that and she adopted it a little too uh, you know unquestioningly. Um, but I think that Ayn Rand's you know biggest mistakes were her opposition to anarchy or her defense of basically a type of statism mm -hmm. and her defense of intellectual property. So I would say that her two biggest substantive mistakes were IP and minarchy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what, what, one of the things that I've always noticed, you really see the statist, collectivist side when you don't, when you embrace the state even a little. You know, uh, Carl Hess said, whenever you defend the state, you end up defending mass murder. And she, I mean, she, you know, said that uh, there are no innocents in war, you know, by being passive in a country that's corrupt, you know, I hope the innocent will die along with the guilty. And all this nonsense. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think she could have had that view if she hadn't had a little bit of lingering minarchism. Because, you know, she, what she's doing, she's taking her pro individual rights point of view, her pro selfishness, her pro egoist view that you have the right to live for yourself. So if it comes down to it in a certain state of emergency or whatever, where you have to choose between yourself and someone else, you could understand, you know, choosing yourself. Right. But that's going to happen a lot more often. If you believe in the state, because the state is going to make these choices that actually, mm -hmm. you know, put you in a situation where you have to choose. It's me or someone else. You know, it's me or the Germans or me or the Russians or whatever, because the government has artificially declared you're part of our group. We're commandeering you and your resources into our battle, our war against this other group, mm -hmm. and they're the enemy. And now you have to make a choice. Are you in? Are you? Are you in favor of Americanism and the West? And your adopted country and the values that it serves, or are you against? Are you, are are you for the uh, you know our enemies? So you need to make a choice. And if you're given that choice, even that might be somewhat irrational, a rational choice. But it's not a choice that they have the right to give you. And you can only believe that if you believe in the state, which Rand unfortunately did. Yeah, unfortunately. Now, now let's. Uh Let's get to um, IP, intellectual property. Um, I think you know a lot of people who sort of hear libertarianism. I think they would say that libertarianism is about you own yourself and you own what comes out of yourself, and you know so you own your hands and you own the physical labor that comes out of your hands, and so you own your mind too. So wouldn't that mean that you have a right to protect 
your ideas, and that's why, you know, I think some people would say, well, you know, Lysander Spooner and Ayn Rand, um, and even, you know, Murray Rothbard, you know, he was against patents, but he supported copyrights, you know, they would say, you know, well, your mind is part of your body, too, and therefore, don't you have a right to, um, isn't, isn't the things that come out of your mind as much of your property as the things that come out of your hands? Why are they uh, wrong? I think you've identified the, the kind of crucial um, error that a lot of people make. Even even Rothbard, um, who was largely correct on these issues, um, it's, it's all based upon John Locke's original way of explaining why we come to own things in the world. And he was reacting to um, basically a feudalistic, monarchistic, you know, sovereign idea. And so he was trying to rebut a guy named Filmer. So Locke was saying that, look, if there's an unowned resource, maybe God gave it to us in commons or whatever. Now, Filmer would say that that means that it was owned by the king or the sovereign like Adam and Adam's heirs and progeny. That filters down to the generations, and that means that the existing monarchs and the sovereignties had a justified claim to ownership. So Locke was trying to rebut that. So Locke said, listen, here's what happens. There's unowned resources. God gives them to humankind in common, but they're unowned. Whoever first mixes, mixes his resources with these uh, – mixes his labor has a better claim than others. Now, followers or thinkers since, since Locke have interpreted this metaphor, this explanation in very literal terms, and what they, what they say is, well, you own yourself, whatever that means. So you own the things you do with yourself or your body, which is labor, and so you own the products of your labor. And if you take this kind of chain of reasoning, which I regard as fairly non-rigorous and metaphorical, more of a pedagogical way of explaining things, but it's not literally true. Um, if you take that too far, then you're going to say, like you said, well, that means that you own anything you create because you own the, the fruits of your labor. Now, it's pretty obvious that the fruits of your labor is drawn upon a metaphor of owning, like, say, an apple tree, right? And you own a tree. You own the land. These are all scarce resources, and the tree bears fruit, apples, like li literally fruits. Or you have a cow, and the cow gets impregnated and has a calf. So the question is who owns the calf? And now you could say that the owner of the cow that gives birth to the calf owns the calf because of a general concept that people own whatever comes from their labor. Well, of course it's not their labor. It's the cow's labor. Um, right. But you see these ideas start infiltrating their ways into this whole defense of liberty and property, and they take a life of their own, and these metaphors get exalted to the status of literal truths, and it ends up confusing people and being used… In, in what I would call a, an equivocational way, that is equivocation. So I think that if you think about these things seriously, you recognize that what we talk about is fruits of labor or creation or adding value. These are things that you do with existing property that you already own, and your mental effort, your creativity, your mind, your labor increases the wealth that you own because it, it transforms resources that you already owned into a more valuable configuration. If you turn one cow into two, now you have two cows. right? If you turn an apple tree into a, a piece of wood with leaves on it plus apples that can be consumed, that's more valuable to you. But So action results in increased wealth, but it doesn't result really in increased – matter that needs to be owned. The way to figure out how to own something is a simple Lockean contractarian Rothbardian proposition. It's simply to say, number one, who was the first person to transform or use or embroider a given unowned resource in the world, like a field or a hut or whatever or a tree? And number two, did they transfer this to someone by contract? So those are the only two questions. We never have to ask who created the thing because metaphysically, as even Ayn Rand recognized, people don't create things. They just rearrange them. 
They transform them into more useful products. So to my mind, this is one of the fundamental misconceptions of libertarian thought, and once you get this straight, then you stop being uh, deluded or, uh, by this uh, intellectual property siren call. All right. I mean one of the things that I've always thought why intellectual property is not real property um, was one, you know, if I have socks and you take my socks, I no longer have socks. You've deprived me of something. Where you don't you can't I still have the idea. You're not depriving me of any idea. If I lend you a book and you make copies and return the book, I'm not out of book. Right? So I mean I think that's Yeah, I think that's right. And, and in fact, so the way I would look at that is um, so the primary rule of identifying – so the primary funda – the fundamental purpose of political philosophy is to set up a scheme by which we can all adhere to and agree. If we follow these rules, we can figure out at any point in time who owns – who's the rightful owner of a given contested scarce resource. Okay, So we believe that these rules are… Over or content. So, um, sorry. Can you say that again? I think you froze a little. Hello. Are you there, Stefan? Hold on one second, guys. Uh, sorry about that. Yes, um, it's giving issues. Uh. Sorry about, sorry about that. No problem. Anyway, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, what Not were you now? saying? Yeah, you're good now, but I, I think Not you're... Oh, well. Can you just repeat what you, you okay said now? The last time? So what I was saying was that you know if you create a resource, uh, if, if creation is not what – creation means transforming existing resources into a more valuable uh, configuration that can be used by the owner or by people he might sell the thing to. So we have to, to divorce in our minds the idea that creation is a source of ownership. It's really not a source of ownership. Every time you can identify a – an action that increases wealth in the world. It's always an action that transforms any resource, but the resource owned already by the actor, by the owner. Otherwise, right. he would not have been able to work with it. So the ownership issue is already settled at the, at the inception of the action itself. So we have to distinguish between action that results in increased wealth and action that results in new property titles, which is basically uh, either one of two things. As I said, finding a resource in the world that is not owned already. Yeah. Or of contract by contract from someone else. Okay. Um. Here's, a, here's just a question a friend of mine asked. I told him I was speaking with you. Uh, he, he said, um, Utili utilitarian questions aside, why would it be unethical to agree to exchange a physical good of my creation only under the terms and conditions that the party receiving the good has agreed not to reproduce that good or exchange the goods further with anyone who doesn't make that agreement? Patent ideas can be arrived at independently, but in practice, monkeys on typewriters don't produce the works of Shakespeare. In summary, why is copyright any different from a trade secret that could be controlled through the enforcement of voluntary contracts? All right, that's a good question, um, but 
it relies upon a lot of uh, assumptions that basically support the IP idea, so I think it's a little bit circular. And it's also confused. So let's, let's first of all, let's distinguish. Look, I hate – I'm a patent lawyer. I hate to start talking in legal precedents and legal terms because I think that's kind of a bullshit excuse that experts use to you know, cow dissent or whatever. So I try not to get into the weeds when I can avoid it. However, the guy you, – he in, in the very way you read the question, if I heard it right, he mixed up patent and copyright. Okay, so first of all… Uh, uh, patent has really nothing to do with copyright. It has nothing to do with plagiarism, and the, the monkeys in the typewriter thing has to do with the fact that it's very unlikely, you know, basically impossible that Romeo and Juliet or Shakespeare's plays would have resulted from a random, you know, co collection of monkeys ty typing randomly upon typewriter keys. But that's a copyright issue. That's not a patent issue. In the patent case, actually, it turns out that in almost every significant case you can point to, an idea comes, an invention comes because its time has come. Okay, So that's why there's all these cases of simultaneous invention. Like, for example, Leibniz and uh, Newton both came up with the calculus at the same time. No, those are not patentable. Because they're abstract ideas, but this happens all the time. Airplanes, uh, other things. Because you can never come up with an invention. Now I'm talking about patents now. Patents cover inventions. Right. You can't come up with an invention unless the basic technology that enables it is already there. And once it's there, you're going to have all these thousands. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. Let's just try that one more time. Um... Hold on one second. So Harry, he just. Uh... All right. Sorry, I have no 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 idea what's going on. But my point is. Um, uh, in, in the field of patents and IP protection for inventions, the case of simultaneous invention is notorious. It's almost inevitable. An idea comes time this come. So when the base technology reaches a certain point, people are going to start going to the next level. Um, so I actually don't agree with the typewriters and monkey example being applied to inventions and patents because… I believe that let's say Shockley had not invented the transistor in the 50s. Well, the transistor would have been would have been invented by now anyway. Okay, um, and lots of patentable ideas. Like let's say the idea of a touchscreen smartphone, like Steve Jobs came up with, or maybe he didn't come up with it. But let's just say he did. I mean, there's no reason to believe that it would it would take much longer for someone to come up with a smart a smartphone with a with a touchscreen interface. Um, so that's different from the issue of whether Romeo and Juliet would have ever been written without copyright. So we have to distinguish between copyright and patent. It is the proponents of patent and copyright that blur the distinction. They meld these things together under the rubric of intellectual property, and they do this for ideological purposes because if you call something property, we libertarians and conservatives, etc., won't really strongly disagree with it because we believe in property rights. So if you can just call it property and lump them together, it's sort of an ideal ideological uh, obfuscation. Sure. So we have to be careful uh, not to agree to that. Now, is there any reason to believe that if we if we did not have a state and a government? That instituted monopolistic grants of protection for copyright, for artistic ideas, and patent for inventions, that we would have no inventions or no creations. I find it hard to believe anyone really believes that. We would have some. My view is we would have more and better and more diversity. Well, yeah, because people would people would just want to just rest on their laurels. For as long as the patent exists, that's that's one reason. So what you're what you're alluding to is the fact that 
if you can come up with a new product that is protected by patent and is popular because it's a good product, like let's say the iPhone, if you could use your patent to stop competition for 17 years, then you could just rest on your lore. You don't really have an incentive to innovate or improve the product because you can't you don't have competition for 17 years because of the government. So that's one that's one argument against the pro IP argument. But my point is the people who pre prefer patent and copyright what they say is that we would have no innovation without it. And then when you challenge them on this they they back down and they say well we would have some innovation. We'd have some novels, we'd have some paintings, we'd have some movies. We would have some inventions, some scientific R&D, but it wouldn't be enough, or it wouldn't be as much as we would have without the government stepping in and you know, interfering and rejuvenating the system and trying to encourage a little bit more. So if that's their argument, which it really has to be in the end, in which they will admit if you corner them, which they don't like to be cornered because they're very dishonest and they're either stupid or they're evil… I mean, or they're biased in large case. I mean, just my experience, my opinion. Then, you know, they will admit that, yeah, we're just trying to slightly tweak the system to encourage more innovation. Well, then the question becomes well, how do you know that we have a suboptimal amount of innovation in artistic creativity right now? How do you know that the cost of your system? will produce any additional amount, and even if it does, how do you know that it's worth the cost? And they never even attempt to answer these questions because they're complete dishonest. They're liars. They're, they're, they're like the people that Thomas Sowell skewers in his book uh, The Vision of the Anointed, which in which he says, listen, all these people, even if you assume that they had good intentions in favoring the welfare state… After the data comes in after one or two or three decades, and they know that it's failing, do they change their call for welfare? No, they double down. So that makes you think maybe they're not really interested in what they said they were in favor of. You know, They just want to self-congratulate themselves, or they want to look like they're the good guys, but their original motivation is just dishonest. It's, it's very similar to the environmentalist movement. I mean… There's disagreements about global warming and this kind of stuff, but if you really believed in carbon producing cause global warming, the obvious thing you would be in favor of would be nuclear power. Nuclear power is plentiful. It could be cheap without the environmentalist regulations. Uh, it produces no you know, carbon uh, offsets. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's just the best form of energy production available on a wide-scale basis, and yet are they promoting this? No. So it makes you wonder, are they really environmentalists, or do they really want to just you know, starve humanity of plentiful energy? And I'm afraid it's the latter, mm -hmm. and it's the same thing with IP advocates. Are they really in favor of innovation? I don't think so. I think they're in favor of a fascist… State system where the government collaborates with corporate entities and protects their industries and grants favors like the kings of of your did. Yeah. Um. There there are many violations um of uh property rights. W what is it about intellectual property that out of all of them you're you're the most interested in uh, critiquing? Well. I had a friend. I was just come back from Turkey. I was at Hop, Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, Property and Freedom Society meeting, and uh, which is an annual meeting there for a group of very radical um, and elite libertarians. And someone asked me if you could explain in one or two or three sentences what is the fundamental argument against IP. What would it be? And I repeated a summary version of something I've written before, and you can find it in my uh, – on my website, c4saf.org. Just, just Google negative servitudes. Now, servitude is a Roman law, civil law term, but in the uh, common law, it has a similar meaning. It's like an easement. But the idea is that um, in a 
a private setting, let's say you and our neighbors, there's nothing wrong with you and I agreeing by contract for me to grant you, let's say, a right of access of my property. Let's say you say, listen, I can get to the local river by walking around your property, but if I can cut across the corner of your property, it will save me time. Will you grant me this right? Maybe I'll do it as a favor. Maybe, I'll, maybe you have to pay me for it, whatever, but if I grant you that right, now you have a property right over my property. You can call it an easement or a servitude or a right of passage or a right of way, but the point is we've now divided the ownership by contract over this property. Likewise, there's nothing wrong with me granting to you as my neighbor uh, a contractual right to prevent me from using my property in certain ways. I already have an obligation not to use my property in certain ways. I can't use my property as an atomic bomb testing site because if you know the bomb goes off, it's going to incinerate everyone in the village. So I've already got a limitation on what I can do with my property because there's a limitation on what we can do with our actions because of your property rights. If I were to explode an atomic bomb on my property, it would infringe the borders of your property. So property rights are the reason why there are some things I can't do with my property. But I could also voluntarily agree to limit what I can do with my property by contract. I could say… If you agree not to use your property, your homestead, for commercial purposes, I will agree to that too. Maybe we can have a better, a better neighborhood, right? Um, so in effect, I grant you a veto right. I grant you as a neighbor the right to stop what I, me from using my property in certain ways. Um, that's called a negative servitude in the civil law or a negative easement in the common law. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the fundamental problem with intellectual property is that the state just announces and grants these negative easements, these negative servitudes to third parties by political fiat, Okay, even though there's no agreement. So it's a transfer of property rights. It's a redistribution. It's a taking. It's an infringement. So if the government just arbitrarily decrees that my neighbor can now appeal to them… To prevent me from using my property in ways that they don't like, in ways that are not trespass, in ways that are not a violation of any kind of pre-existing contract, then the government has effectively taken part of my property right and transferred it to someone else. So the, the fundamental problem with intellectual property is that it's this type of thing. It's the transfer by the state of a control right of existing already owned property to a third party. Who did not acquire that right by contract or because of any kind of tort or anything like that. It's just a redistribution of property rights. It's theft. Right. Well, the state is uh, certainly good in that area. It, it is. It's good at a couple things. It's good at destruction and it's yep. good at propaganda. Yes, it is. It's good at selling its, its role. As a benevolent sort of helper, when it's really just the ultimate dest destroyer. Yeah. You know, what, one of the things that I've sort of never understood is that I, I talk to people who advocate the government, and it's it's not that they're ignorant. They're aware of Guantanamo. They're aware that the government lies to go to war. They're aware that the government admits we have people who are innocent. But we can't let them go because we're afraid that if we let them go, they're going to want to take revenge and be future terrorists. People are aware at that of the war on drugs and how it impoverishes people, and yet they still hold on to the myth of the state. You know, it seems a bit weird. I can understand embracing the state if if you're ignorant and you don't see the destruction. But you don't. I. You don't. What? Why do you think it is that they they acknowledge the violence and yet they still believe that the state can protect? Well, I think for those two people that they have no I won't say no imagination, but they just don't they don't know that there's an uh, an alternative, right? They don't really understand that. So if if you're brainwashed for your whole life by the school system and by the media and by the government and you think this is the only way to have order in life. Well, then they're preferring order to chaos, and I admire that. I appreciate that. And that's what the state is counting on, right? So They've been basically brainwashed by government propaganda. So what do you say to them? I don't know. I guess you say to them, 
try to overcome your upbringing, but <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah. I just say people, I just tell people, you know, let's just give anarchists anarchy a chance. We could always revert back to statism. Well, what I always say is, you know, when I talk to people and they, uh, they often get upset at what I say, and I say, listen, let's step back for a second. You and I have a disagreement on po politics, but what's the reality that we're living in? We're living in a state-dominated world where you're basically getting your way. You basically won, right? So you believe there should be taxation. There's taxation. You believe that I should be forced to comply with your the rules that are announced by the government that you think is somewhat legitimate, and if I don't, I go to jail, and that's the situation now. So basically, you you guys have won. We have a statist world. You've won your situation. You know, ninety ninety percent of the people believe in what you believe, to one degree or the other. So, why are you getting so upset that there's one guy who is complying with your laws? I'm paying your taxes. Uh, I am threatened with, you know, the prospect prospect of prison for life. If I violate some of your rules, like tax evasion or, or um, evading the draft or selling, you know, evading the drug laws or whatever, so you basically won. So why are you so upset that I'm just complaining about it? Are you really? Do you really want to have total victory in the sense that you get to force the comply with? Laws under threat of prison and can't complain about it. Is that right? So, you know, I usually get no response to that kind of question, obviously. Well, <laughs> I don't know what's happening today. Um, we will try to get him back again. Uh, Hold on a second. We will try to get him back again. I don't know what's... <laughs> aye, 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 aye. Google Hangouts doesn't usually do this. There are some problems with it, but he's he's just been fuzzing in and out. Um, hold on. We'll try to get him back. I guess Google Hangouts is just um, – Yeah, I don't know what it is. But anyway, so I'm back now. So uh, where were we? What's, what's the next thing? Um, well, actually, I would like to talk because I, I sort of felt always this way, and I, I like your article, uh, Libertarianism and Bullying. Um, I was also not uh, – I was also bullied. And uh, from my experience, and uh, I was never just bullied by one guy. In fact, um, I – there were people who were sort of nice to me one on one. Uh, they would, you know, be friends with me. They would want to hang out. But um, one of the things that I've discovered was if other people would bully me, in order to fit in, people would just uh, chime in. So they they would be liked. If you know, bullying me is the popular thing. And it, and at least for me, you know, this sort of influenced partially my libertarianism, where I see, you know. How in order to this pack mentality and and how the individual will you know submit to the group and how if you know more people are being mean and cruel and vicious it sort of becomes acceptable. Um, so I guess at least for you, what what about libertarianism and bullying? Well, it, it was just a weak hypothesis I had. I mean, in my case, I was small and I, I was bullied younger, and it made me. You know, just seized with the idea of injustice about these kind of things. So it made me maybe focus on the idea of justice. So I don't know if there's a correlation or not in right. general, but to me, that's really the essence of libertarianism, right? It's like the idea that you should let live and let live, have tolerance for other people, uh, respect other people's property, and you know, li live in harmony with each other. And to me, they see opposite of the very idea of bullying. So. To my mind, bullying is a stand-in for the for what we're opposed to, 
which yeah. is aggression. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, well, if people view the world as a playground, and you know, I want your toy. You know, you have two toys. I don't have any. Let me just you know push you and take it. So yeah. Go. Yeah. Um, do you th do you think um, are you optimistic or or pessimist? Do you do you think that um, do you think we can we can win the intellectual battle or you know is mankind just you know so far gone and just you know that's a good question. Um, what do you think? I, I'm a, I'm pretty misanthropic. I don't have a positive view. I I I think you know we learn from history that we do not learn from history, as Hegel said. And I, I you know we people people sort of you know make the same mistake over and over again, and they're surprised at the results every time. Um, there, there's this excellent book called uh, ADD Democracy by um, I'm blanking out on the guy's name, but basically it's about you know how. These politicians, they, they say the same things over and over again. They constantly lie, and people fall for it every single time. They fall for it every single time. And Yeah. I, 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 I sort of think that we have to distinguish. Are you pessimistic in your own life or as a general activist or something? So as an activist, I, I view it at best as a long-term project, although things can change rapidly when you're not expecting it, like in the, uh, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I don't expect that. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't expect a great decline or a great explosion. Although you could have a great explosion in the good sense because of technology in the next 30 years. So we'll see. So, but in I think your duty and your you know your mission as an ind individual is to try to live a good life. Right, so you can distinguish between your own life and your activism and your long-term pursuits. So you can be a and you could be an optimist that I'm going to do better, my kids are going to do better, I have a good situation. You know, if you don't, if you don't sell drugs and go to jail like Adam Kokesh did. I mean, Adam Kokesh, for example, who's a friend of mine who I admire. Yeah. He's in jail right now because he. Uh, he challenged the state's laws on, on guns. He has probably good cause to be pessimistic for his own life. Unless he, you know, finds a way out of this, he's his life is going to be severely impacted, if, if that, for the rest of his life. So if you're in a situation where the government has ensnared you or you've let yourself be ensnared or you've arranged it even… Then I think that pessimism is warranted, but you know, compared to what? Um, there's no, there's been no golden age of society. You know, what do you want to live in Rome in the year 200? Do you want to live in America in the year 1792? If you're black, I don't know. I don't think so. So. I don't think there's been any golden age. This is a, as golden a, of an age as any. It's got its it's got its problems. Um, it's better in most ways, in my opinion, than the previous ages. And if you just navigate your ways around society, you can you can prosper in it. So in that sense, I'm optimistic for the long term future of humanity. I don't even know. I mean, I don't know what long term means. If if entropy is real, you know, if the universe is going towards a heat death. Then in the end, it's it's in it's you know it's the end anyway. So I don't know. These long-term metaphysical questions seem to me intractable. Intractable. So we have to focus upon the near future. We don't have to be present-oriented, but we can look at the near future. You know, the next one, two, three hundred years, and try to live in that. And so I am hopeful that in the next few hundred years that we. Um, we humans can find a way to keep improving despite the existence of the state, right? And if we do keep improving, one big improvement could be that the state's role gets diminished precisely because people start doubting its efficacy or its necessity or its justice. And uh, whether that's going to happen or not, I can't say.
but I do think gradual historical and economic enlightenment plays a good role because I think truth in history is on our side. So that's sort of my thin hope that something good will emerge and or better will emerge in the next 10, 30, 50, 100, 300 years. I hope so. Yeah. If this is the best of all possible worlds, then what must the others be like? Right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there. I mean, it. It seems you know, it's Syria. War with Syria may have been averted just because of all the popular um, hatred against it. So you know, I mean, if if America doesn't attack Syria, you know, I think that'll largely be because people uh, you know, spoke out against it. It was not a popular move. Yeah, it's, 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 it's become clear at this point that it's it's a disaster waiting to happen. So the, the justifications given for it, which were similar to those given for the invasion of Iraq, now longer you know they now no longer hold sway with people because now they distrust them. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've heard some. You know, anarchists talk about you know like uh, the free state project and you know um, just buying some land uh, and just starting you know uh, an anarchy uh, place away from the state and you know just recording stuff and you know in the hopes that if for some reason you know the state ever attacks us we we'll, we can make videos and and show them to people see look how violent the state is and and stuff like that. Um, and what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, that sort of just seems. Well, if that was really your goal, you would just bury somewhere some kind of indestructible medium, right? Like the a record of what we're doing. You know, sort of like the parallel of the uh, the golden inscribed record on the uh, the Voyager thing or the uh, you know the spaceship we sent out to outer space. Um, but. The, that people will move to New Hampshire or some other state as part of a project, you're going to get some people because they're looking for something to do, and I appreciate that. Um, but is it going to take off? I doubt it. At the ballot box. Hello? Do you think? Do you think that we should be? Um you know, part of active in the political process. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, some some anarchists, you know, say, you know, I think it was very good. You know, Ron Paul ran for president. He was on the stage. He educated a lot of people. He exposed government lies. You know, you have other people who say voting is aggression. It's a waste of time. I, I'm not as adamant as my friend Wendy McElroy is that, for example, that if you vote, you're you're basically committing aggression. Um, I do agree that it's a waste of time. At best, yeah. um, I think it's the wrong focus. But if people want to do that, I, I don't oppose it. I, I believe in trying a lot of options. Um, I just think it's futile in the long run because I don't think politics is the way to achieve liberty. I really don't. I think that the the problem is if you say that, the activists will say, "Well, then, what is the way to achieve victory?" And if you say, "I don't know." That dissatisfies them because they want results now. You know they're very impatient. So yeah. I'm afraid that that impatience makes people settle for uh, something that's just not real. At least they feel like they're doing something, and that's fine. But I don't know if they are doing something. You know they may be doing worse. So by buying into the system or by you know helping promote a guy that's a sellout like you know Rand Paul or someone like that. I mean Rand Paul is better than. Most politicians, but what's the expression? Uh, damned by faint praise, you know. Yeah. Um, it's a problem. Um, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think. I mean, I, I, I you know. I mean, I, I think the best way. You know, that, I'm a big fan of Stefan Molyneux because I, I sort of agree with his approach that you know. The best way to see freedom is just the way we don't like how the state treats us. It we should, you know, 
treat other people the opposite. You know, be a peaceful parent. Don't you know? Stay. Right. Um, no, I agree. I agree with that. I think that um, I'm a big fan of Bollinger too. He's a friend of mine, and he's great. Um, I think that's correct. I think that what you can do in your private life is affect what you can affect, right? Which will be your children, people you know, the way you act, and if all you can do in your life is live an exemplary life, you know, give off an air of you know integrity and let people know that you are sincere and you're a good I don't know what else you can do and you know inculcate you in, in your friends and your wife and your family and your kids similar values to me that's a huge um, it's a, that's a huge thing to do um, and if if more people did it then we would we would transform the next generation that's coming up and they would be more liberty minded more rational more fair and maybe we'd have a better world. So if you want to do something practical, it's just live a good life. Live a successful life and teach your children and other people when they're interested in being taught you know, in virtues that are very uncontroversial. Honesty, truth, justice, fairness, equity. Um, live and let live. Is a fundamental rule, and I don't think it's that hard to spread that message to other people. Live and let live. Every almost everyone really agrees with that, and the people that don't, you know, we need to keep an eye on them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I I think a lot of it also has to do with, you know, I th I think people you know people work hard. A lot of them have a job they don't like. They just want to go home and you know. And watch some brain candy. They don't really want to think about any serious issues. That's depressing, and you know, I I I think a lot of think that's what it is. And the state, you know, it wants people who are just passive and um, sort of just you know accepting. And you know, I, I think a brave new world is more accurate than 1984. The government doesn't have to beat people uh, with a club. It just has to make them totally disinterested in the fact. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There's something to that. So, you know, which is one of the reasons why I and others oppose state education. I mean, if you could if you could change one thing in society, out of all the four or five, you know, taxation, the drug war, regular war, intellectual property, state education, government roads, all these things, which one would you choose? This is a libertarian, wet dream, fantasy kind of thing, but. I've always thought I would choose state education. I don't want to, you know, brainwash these kids. We want a new generation of kids to emerge unscathed and unmarked by the state. Well, that's very hard. I mean, even private schools, you know, they have to get um, a lot of the same textbooks they need, you know, a, be accredited by the state. I mean, how? I mean, I, I, you have children, right? I mean, how? How do you educate? Where do you send them to school, or how? You know. I've got a son, and he goes to a private Montessori school, but even he is uh, uh, exposed to ideas that I think are the result of the modern alliance between the government and education. So, you know, it's just like telling someone, listen, you can't go to the neighborhood because there's dangerous guys there. It's, it's unsafe. It's the same thing. You have to say there are dangerous ideas out there that – you have to be aware of. You you can be exposed to them like I was, but you have to be aware of what they're trying to do. They're trying to manipulate you, um, and so I think you shouldn't hide it. You should just inoculate them ahead of time. Ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, I I I I agree. Um. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't just, um, maybe, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't even just preach. Maybe it seems, you know, I mean, I mean, one of the things that I, that I, that I hear a lot is, you know, I, I, you have to be pragmatic. Um, 
what you say is good in theory, but you know, uh, there's no. I see no evidence for for a libertarian society. Uh, you know, we have to be practical, and so you know, the states here, and you know, what you're suggesting is unrealistic. Um, what what do you say to those? Yeah, that's difficult to deal with because they they've been fed a package deal right all their lives. Like there's a there's a conflict between practicality and morality, and I agree with Ayn Rand. There's there's no conflict. Um, I think you, you should say, listen, you're a good person. You think we should get along as neighbors. There's no reason not to expand that scale a little bit and say that in our region, in our city, why shouldn't we all respect each other's rights? You know, It's about tolerance and cosmopolitanism and diversity and uh, recognizing that we have to live together and that we, we prefer to live together in peace and prosperity. So you have to keep spreading that message and say, listen, if you really understood a little bit more about economics… … which if you want to, I can give you some tips, you know, then you would not be advocating the following rule because it's got all kinds of unintended consequences that are going to be self-destructive to your claimed goals. So I just try to focus upon the fact that they're basically decent people and say, listen, you're just choosing the wrong means to achieve what you say you want, and you know… Two thirds, half the time, they agree with me in principle. Yeah, you're right. This is my main goal. I have no reason to think this is going to achieve it. But they they don't have any other. They're used to the democratic process, so they think this is the only way you achieve it is by democracy. So if you take if you take that away from them, they feel like they're helpless. They have nothing else to do to achieve their goals, and that's a big challenge. I mean, you can't just say, well, then you should be an anarchist like me. Because then they'll say, well, what has I gotten you? right? Because they're thinking it's a cost-benefit thing. They're thinking it's, it's a means to an end. They're not thinking in terms of justice or principles or integrity. Yeah. They're thinking, how does being an anarchist get me what I want? No one will listen to me, so I'm not going to get what I want. And that's a tough one. It's really yeah. tough. Yeah. I, it reminds me of a similar thing. I remember my um, – I was – I'm an atheist, but I, I was raised as a, a modern Orthodox Jew, and I remember my talking religion with my grandmother, and my grandmother said, you know, when I was your age, I, I sort of felt the same way, but I said to myself, you know, I have, I have a family, um, I have a community, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to isolate myself from the community. I, I, I don't want, you know, to uh, have people just say, oh, this guy's a crazy, a kook. This guy's uh, this person's crazy. So you know, you, you know, you just have to grit your teeth and. Yeah, I agree. There's nothing else to do at a certain point. So. Yeah, I think I, I mean I think a lot of people. I think it's just I think a fear probably of the unknown. People people know the state may be evil, but they they know they know what the evil is. It's the evil they know. Yeah, I think that's right, and they think that. It's a necessary evil. They think that you have to have it, so they'd rather just accept it and just try to work to improve it, even though that, that's kind of futile. So that's their mentality. So how we open their eyes is a difficult question. I don't know. Um, maybe over time, anarchism will spread insidiously. God damn it. Okay, sorry. It'll spread insidiously, and they'll just get used to it over time. I mean that's my hope. I mean… Think about the attitude of people in the 1990s or 2000s compared to the 1970s or 80s. Um, communism had not fallen yet. right? The USSR had not imploded, but now it has, and so there's this widespread recognition that the Soviet Union and communism is not viable. So even your typical Democrat leftist types in the US and Europe… They don't, use, they don't really want to get rid of capitalism per se. They understand that capitalism and a free market is an engine of progress and prosperity. They just want to balance these things. They want to you know, restrain it for the good of the public or whatever. So they recognize at least that capitalism is important. So my hope is that over time, experience will gradually enlighten people about economic uh, issues. And they will gradually become more and more inclined to be in favor of freedom and the free the free society. Cool. 
Um, my next question, I guess, is about argumentation ethics. I, I, I read it a little, and maybe I don't understand it, or maybe I just didn't find it that persuasive, but can maybe you go into it a, a little? Yeah, that is, um, you know, there are different arguments for liberty, right? There are pragmatic ones, there are consequentialist ones, there's natural law types, and Hans Hermann Hoppe, who was a student of Mises, well, Rothbard, but a aficionado of Mises, he's basically a Misesian Austrian economist, political theorist who, who became a huge Rothbardian, in the 1980s started publishing um, a new, a sort of a new argument for individual rights, which he derives from the work of some German philosophers, Habermas and Appel. And his argument is that if you just forget about the natural law arguments and natural rights arguments, that we know that um, certain things, there's a certain structure to argumentation about political norms that is inherent in the very endeavor itself. Because you have at least two people engaging in a cooperative discussion. Oh, not again. <laughs> about what's true. And that cooperative discussion. Hold on. Well, I guess we'll make this the last question because he, he seems to be fuzzing in and out. Um, hold on one second. Hold on one second. I don't know why this happened. Hold on. Let's see if we can just get him back. Um, hold on one sec. Hold on. See if hmm. sorry. hey, sorry about that. That no, was sorry. I was mid sentence when I realized we were cut off again. Yes. Yeah, so, so can um, you just... so argumentation ethics? So the idea is that oh, that's my poodles. Um, <laughs> the, the 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 idea is that um. Hoppe was trying to say, listen, there might be something to natural rights arguments, but there are some problems with it too. Let's do an end run around this. Let's say – let's recognize that any discussion we might have about norms, political norms, what the rules should be, is always in the context of a, a real discourse between two people in which they're respecting each other's property rights in their bodies because it's not a… It's a cooperative thing. It's not a, a conflictual thing. They're not trying to say, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, I'm going to kill you. So they're respecting each other's property. If they're not, then it's not a real argument, and there's coercion being involved. So the idea is that we can we can root any pos we, we can come up with a filter. We can say, listen, we know that there is no possible way any ethic or norm could ever be justified if it contradicts the presuppositions of, of argumentation itself because any norm would have to be proposed and justified during argumentation. So the question then is what are the norms presupposed by civilized discourse? That is by like you and I sitting down today to talk to each other. Even though we're not in person, you and I are trying to 
get to the truth of certain things by the force of reason alone. There's no coercion. There's no, you know, you're not telling me, Stefan, if you don't agree with me at one minute and mark, I'm going to shoot you or whatever. If you did, it would be a different discussion, right? It wouldn't be a genuine argument. So the fact that any real argument is inherently characterized by the participants um, respecting each other's, you could say, property rights in their bodies has certain normative implications. I mean it's really difficult to argue that the person should have no so if you're just a total solipsist or a monomaniac and you're like, I'm the only guy in the world that has rights, and here's my argument to you why this is correct. Well, you have to treat the guy you're talking to as a possessor of his body. So you're sort of contradicting yourself if in the middle of your argument you say, I know I'm granting you rights in your body right now, but as soon as we're done talking, I'm going to enslave you again. I mean, there's something incongruent about that. So that's the basic insights that Hoppe has with his argumentation ethics. That ethics that there's a, an incompatibility between what he calls socialist arguments, which means using other people's property without their consent, um, and capitalist arguments, which means uh, recognizing people's right to control scarce resources that, that they've acquired by first use under lock or by contract from a previous owner. So he's basically trying to show that the only coherent political theory is one that's compatible with the Lockean conception of things um, because you have a choice to make in life. Either you're part of society or you're not. You know, Either you're a bully or you're not. And if you're not, then you've admitted certain values that you've joined in with. And if you are, then you're just a danger to other people, and they have to take you into account and treat you like a technical problem to be dealt with, like a, you know, a wild cow or a wild leopard or a disease. And if they have to use force to stop you from raiding their farmhouse or attacking their people or themselves… Then they have to do that. There's no other choice because you're not part of the community of reason. And if you are, then you've admitted certain things that can't be denied. So it's the idea that recognizing all this shows you that the only political norms that could ever be justified are the libertarian ones. Right. All right. Very good. Um, looks like we're fuzzing. In and out. I, I hope this doesn't happen usually with Google Hangouts. So maybe, maybe we should just end it, so we don't. Just That's good. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed All it. Right. And um, I'm let's glad. do it again sometime. Sure. I would love to have you on. Uh, does Google Hangouts usually do this with you? Uh, maybe we could find a different medium. Uh, I. It's getting better, like Skype. You know, Skype was better and it was worse in the old days, and now it's getting better. So maybe Hangouts will improve. So yeah, I've, I've had a lot of Google Hangouts problems, but. Uh, it could be the fact that I have an iPhone. I don't know, or maybe maybe it's my Wi-Fi. But I think it's a Google Hangouts problem. But uh, it'll be better in the future, I think. All right, good. So I'd, I'd love to have you on. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks Thank a lot. I appreciate. It. I enjoyed it. Me too. Bye bye. Thank you.